Welcome to the CNBC Africa special. I am Kopano Gumbi coming to you from Santon, Johannesburg, where the brightest minds from all corners of the world have gathered to discuss the future of education. <laughs> International experts came from as far afield as Australia, the UK, Ghana and the Middle East to join local leaders in the education sector for the Future of Education Summit 2019. With the theme Reactive versus Proactive, the summit examined the significant changes in the education industry that are changing mindsets and revolutionising education to benefit the workplace, society and the economy. As uh, today's uh, theme, Reactive or Proactive, uh, already states, uh, is the education space or the higher education space reacting or being proactive in uh, not only its, uh, its own existence, so are you uh, on the brink of extinction or are you uh, reinventing yourself fast enough to be relevant? I mean, it was only a couple of years back where we were even talking about people studying for a degree and by the time they got out and got their degree, the degree was obsolete. And uh, that many people were taking on jobs uh, that hadn't existed by the time they started studying. So these are some of the issues that we need to tackle. And, um, you know, by the end of today, we might have already had to change uh, what we've discussed because the world is changing so fast that uh, we can't keep up with it. The Future of Education Summit is now in its fourth year. It is the brainchild of Rakesh Wahi, co-founder of the ABN Group. Everyone recognizes the importance of an efficient and outcome-driven education sector. It does not matter which country you travel to, conversations invariably hinge on the available, availability of relevant human resources. There are far too many graduates who are either unemployed or in completely different vocations from their education. There is a mismatch at various levels and the lag between market needs and regulations continues to increase. Technology is disrupting the industry, and a lot needs to be done from the perspective of legislation, cultural acceptance, curriculum, accreditation, and program delivery to be able to take advantage of what technology can offer. With artificial intelligence, blockchain, big data, and other disruptive changes that are, that are impacting both learning and industry, there's a shortage of engineers, technicians, and qualified computer programmers. There is a need for greater focus on STEM subjects to meet this demand. Furthermore, skills-based training is becoming more relevant as employers want entry-level staff who are ready for the workplace. In my view, there is a serious mismatch between how we think about the future and the changes that we are prepared to make to enable the future that is staring us in the face. I welcome you all to what I believe will be an excellent and interactive forum. Your presence and contribution is appreciated. Thank you very much. In his opening address, Professor Adam Habib, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of the Witwatersrand, addressed the fear that universities will make way for online education. You know, people have been predicting the closure of universities for 700 years. Uh, and there's a new round of these guys who are predicting the closure. And if there's anything I put, if you're really a serious gambler, take an advice from me, put the money on the fact that these universities are going to survive. If you think they're going to disappear, then you're living in a different world. Uh, and it's important to say because universities have been evolving for 700 years. If you look at the university of the 15th and 14th and 15th and 16th century, the Oxfords, they were really monasteries, what today are called monasteries of religious schools, or what in Pakistan would be known as the madrasa. They were not substantive places of knowledge. Now, in that period of time, the religious schools were precisely one of the few places where knowledge was encoded, and it often happened through the religious forms. If you went 100 years ago, the religious, the universities were effectively teaching places. They did very little significant research. That happened in structures outside. If you look at the university of the last 30 years, they're not only big 
t uh, places where they produce graduates, but they are also big uh, creators of knowledge of one kind or the other. The university has been evolving for a long period of time, and I think we're in a moment that the universities have to evolve. And I'm going to speak about that in a minute, but I think let's get out of the fear mongering that the universities are all going to disappear. Uh, today, there are far more universities than existed 50 years ago, and there are far more institutions, universities 50 years ago than existed 200 years ago. The second is the myth of graduate unemployability. It doesn't exist. I mean, I'm struck by how the perceptions and the reality. Let me give you the real number. In a country of what is the official rate of unemployment is 30%. The real rate is probably 40%. And for young people, it's probably between 50 and 55%, depending on which category you're looking at. Uh, the real rate of unemployment of graduates system-wide, I'm not even talking events, system-wide is between six and seven and a half percent. That's the latest research coming out. So compared to what exists in the country, there is no doubt that a degree gets your job quicker and at a much higher rate. South Africa is, has the highest return rate on a degree from any country in the world. Now that in part is a problem, by the way, because it shows you've got such a skills crisis that effectively your degrees are being priced out uh, to an incredible extent. But I think we need to be clear about what we mean by this graduate unemployability. As a general rule, if you don't have metric your unemployment rate is about 35 to 40%. If you do have metric, you have an unemployment rate of around 25 to 30%. If you have a first, if you got TIVET, a college, a TIVET vocational college degree, you're looking at an unemployment rate of 15 to 18%. If you got a first degree, you're looking at an unemployment rate of between six to seven and a half percent, system-wide. And I guarantee you, if you took it in the top-end universities, your unemployment rate is below two to three percent. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adam Habib. The gloves are off. Uh, I think we're all warmed up after that uh, opening talk, and I think we're gonna keep the momentum going by going straight into our first panel discussion. Technology and the changing face of education. Professor Angina Parikh is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Academic at the University of Johannesburg. She is a member of the Department of Education Evaluation Panel for Research Output in Higher Education. Professor Adam Habib is the Vice-Chancellor and Principal at the University of the Witwatersrand. A Professor of Political Science, he has over 30 years of academic, research and administration experience. Professor Seth Coonan is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor International at Curtin University, Australia. John Louis is the Head of Academics at Advitech School Division, consisting of 109 schools across South Africa, Kenya and Botswana. He is currently completing a Master of Arts in Technology and Learning Design. The panel moderator is Dan Adkins, the CEO Middle East for the Transnational Academic Group. He has lectured in IT, Economics, Accounting, Marketing, Management, Organizational Behavior, Entrepreneurship and Law. We hear people talking about how the students of today are going to be participating in and working in jobs and industries that don't even exist. And this is always said as if it's something revolutionary and something that in mankind's history we've never faced before. But if we think back to the 1940s, rocket scientists didn't exist, satellite technician didn't exist, those weren't worked into the school systems, and yet the people who were educated in the very traditional ways during the 1940s are the ones who put satellites in orbit and humans on the moon, built the computers and internet that we rely on today. 
So the question is, is having technology in the classroom the thing that will prepare students for the future, or are there other more important skills such as being a self-learner, being a good analyst, synthesizing new information, and things of that nature that are actually far more important. So with that, I'd like to ask each of the panelists to give a brief opening statement as to their thoughts on the subject and how they look at addressing technology in the classroom. I'm actually kind of fascinated because when we talk about technology and we talk about the next generation and what is the role of, of higher education, government, uh, policy makers, industry in nurturing and developing the next generation of, 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 of high level skills, there's an assumption that we almost got to throw the baby out of the bathwater. And that, you know, what we did in the past no longer holds us in good stead going into the future because of the technological uh, revolution and the changes uh, that have come about and are likely to come even f further changes going into the future. I think that's a very dangerous way of thinking about the development of skills. For me, change is inevitable, and that's where we need to start. Today it's a four hour and fourth industrial, tomorrow's going to be the fifth, and God knows what it's going to be like in the next 20 to 30 years. So the first fundamental premise that we must work off in the development of skills is that change is inevitable. And in order to prepare the students of the future to understand that the environment that they will be going into will be a constantly evolving, changing environment. And those are the kind of skill sets one needs to develop in the young generation. In my role as the Deputy Vice Chancellor of a higher education institution responsible for the academic project, I've always maintained that we need to ensure that yes, we are evolving as well in relation to changes, so that in our own educational practices, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's outside of the classroom, we do incorporate technology. But technology is never going to replace the human interface. And that for me is absolutely important. I'm not quite so sanguine as my colleague that universities as bricks and mortar institutions have this long-term future just because we've had it for the last 700 years. If you look at the economy of universities, it is extraordinarily expensive to maintain the very large institutions that we have in terms of the physical space, the space in terms of the numbers of people that have to be employed there and the like. And if you look at state funding of universities, it's actually going in the wrong direction. So if you look at Scotland where I used to work, the universities are getting less money per student and are not able to get enough students, or if they're told to take more students, they're not getting enough to actually be able to sustain the level of quality that they need to have in order to be able to teach those students. So Scottish universities are increasingly precarious because governments are unwilling to pay for them and the students are unable to pay the amount that would be necessary to maintain them in the way that they currently are. So with that being said, I think universities will have to change massively. I think that they will still exist in some form, but I think they're going to be very, very different beasts. Education, as in terms of delivery, using technology, I think is going to be one of these areas that is going to be revolutionary, but it's not revolutionary at the moment. And it's not revolutionary at the moment for very much the reasons that almost every colleague that's spoken so far has said. If we look at what we're trying to do in a classroom, we're trying to enable students to be self-directed learners. We're trying to enable students to be able to analyze complex materials in original and creative ways. 
we're trying to create and work with students to enable them to interact with other people in ways that make them more con able to do better contributions to their communities and their societies. And by and large, if we look at most of the technologies for delivering online or different methods of education, they're actually not focused on that. I'm, I'm of the view of a combination of the two. Actually, I'm not sanguine about the university. I'm just saying, let's not imagine that the university is now dead. And it's all going to be replaced by learning on the internet, which is m much of the, what I see as the populist posture around higher education that has emerged. The university has to evolve. And you're absolutely right. I still think there'll be a brick and mortar version, but I think that's going to be an expansive footprint in 10, 20, 30 years that's going to be digital, that's going to be, have a digital footprint that far in, uh, is far larger than the actual bodies that exist in the brick and mortar component of the institution. But I think the brick and mortar component is going to be important. You know, the way you create elites in a society, whether you like it or not, is not simply through what they learn, it's who they interact with, what networks they develop. The universities for the last hundred years have as much a role as finding marriage partners for rich people as they do for the learning process. We still haven't scratched the surface of the real technologies that are going to fundamentally transform higher education. But what you have to start doing is starting to experiment now. And what those experimentations do is create a bridge from what exists today to what the potential possibilities are. We're beginning to experiment with AR and VR, but they, we're at the, at the beginning stages of what is truly possible. What you're never going to do is develop those technologies to their fruition and then say to your academics or your students, start experimenting. What you have to do is seeing it as an evolving experimentation over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And I think that's part of the learning process. What I actually want to do is just tell you what we're doing. We're from a very privileged space because we're uh, private school schooling. But just what we're doing in trying to understand how we can address what is deemed to be that gap between what the world of work requires, uh, the World Economic Forum uh, puts out reports on a regular basis in terms of the skills that are required, and things like critical thinking, negotiation skills, all of that is there. And so I just want to share a little bit about what we're doing in terms of trying to address those gaps. What is very important for us is that our students are confident with 21st century technologies. So what we've done is we've created these what we call new age technology spaces. And in those spaces you will find 3D printers, laser cutters, Arduino boards, um, electronics, robotics, drones, all of that sort of thing. And ar around that, we've tried to put a curriculum to it, but it's more about just ensuring that our kids are confident with a new technology. Um, on the curriculum side, it, there is a lot of literature that shows that technology does not actually enhance student performance on a time-constrained test. We do use technology, if I take mathematics, for example, we use technology uh, a lot um, to, to enhance our support uh, programs. So in November, a lot of our students got free extra lessons. They were all online, and they worked really well for the students based on the feedback. But in actual teaching and learning, in actual pedagogy, in using technology, um, specifically subject apps and platforms, we have found that it do, they, they don't necessarily enhance the student performance. Basic education as a crucial foundation for future success. Professor Moiketi Leteke holds the UNESCO Chair of Open Distance Learning at UNISA. He's a professor of philosophy of education and editor-in-chief of the scholarly journal Africa Education Review. Stacey Brewer is the CEO and co-founder of Spark Schools. She is an innovator who has actively disrupted the norm and is dedicated to making a difference and solving South Africa's education challenges. 
Omar Farouki is the founder and president of Coded Minds Global, a Dubai-based global education company. Disrupting the education industry from the ground up, his vision of Coded Minds merges public and private education. Hatim El Tayeb has served as Dean at Africa Leadership Academy since 2016. A 2009 graduate of Harvard University, Hatim leads teachers and students at African Leadership Academy's flagship two-year premium university diploma program. The panel moderator is Chris Bishop, the head of programming at CNBC Africa. He has spent 37 years in journalism and has tackled print, radio, and TV, spending 20 years reporting on the African story. We spoke yesterday. You said that there's a lot of problems in education. If we can't fix education, what are we going to do in the future? I don't think in this country, and in many ways that we, we, we approach education, I don't think we take education seriously and I'll explain why. We have policies in place, and they mean well. But I think the, the major issue has always been how to put those policies in place, how to implement those policies, and how to ensure that the implementation of that policy, those policies, has that desired impact. They leave that desired footprint, and I'll explain why. Um, Statistics South Africa has just released a very damning report on the inequalities in this country. And what struck me in that report is the simple fact that while inequalities are decreasing among whites, they are decreasing among Indian and Asians, and they have kind of stabilized among colors, they have kind of increased exponentially among, among, among blacks. And that's where the problem is. Our education system has to serve the poorest of the poor and it has to serve them optimally. Sadly, that's not happening. Um, and there are many reasons. We, with education, and I'll be blunt, every Tom, Dick, or Harry, or Ordinary Jane can walk into the class and teach. Mm. I'm a teacher by training, I said that yesterday. I spent four years training at the National University of Lesotho to become a teacher. I, I made a choice to become a teacher, and I went through a very rigorous process. Teaching is not just walking into a class and teaching. You, you study the content, you study the methodology, you study the child, you study the rules, and you, you go through a whole process of training, micro-teaching, where you are given the skills how to teach. It's, it's a rigorous process. And I'm proud to be a teacher. I'm disheartened that there are people who are in the education system, they walk into class, they are teaching, they've got no idea at all. They're getting paid. Some of them even retire in that spot. And I'll give an example. In one of the parliamentary sessions, Prime Minister, no, not Minister of Education, Mucheha, was asked by a DA parliamentarian to inform parliament how many teachers, well, in double inverted commas, how many teachers are either unqualified or underqualified, but they are in the system. Now, the minister was at pains. I think the figure was in the region of over 70,000. Now, when you have 70,000 people who have metric and who, and I'll be blunt again, who masquerade as teachers, we have a problem. Then we are putting the future of our children in doubt. Okay. Most recent Pills assessment cited that 78% of our grade fours in this country cannot read for meaning which is absolutely dire. And I think in terms of what are the different problems, there's a variety of problems from the curriculum, the standards that we expect our children to deliver, the professional development of our teachers, the esteem we have as a public on becoming a teacher. I mean, it's the easiest degree to get. If you phone one of the universities, you can't get into another degree, they say become a teacher. So overall, there's really low esteem, respect on the education sector, and we expect very little from our children and from our teachers. And at Spark, we aim to completely change that. And that's, that's exactly what we've done. Is I'm very hopeful for education in this country, and I have to be, um, because at Spark, we're trying to completely disrupt this inequality that we're seeing by pro pri providing affordable education and to people, families that have been underserved in the past. And when we talk about affordability, we're looking at affordability to the country. So we benchmark our total cost to educate on government's total cost to educate to be a proof model on what is possible at government spend. We currently spend the greatest proportion of our budget and GDP on education, and yet we rank bottom of the world. So how do we completely change that system? 
And at Spark, we follow a blended learning model, which is technology that's been integrated into the schooling system that allows us to operate at our price point, but also creates a very data-rich environment so we can differentiate our instruction. So we don't screen um, for any of our kids as a first-come, first-served basis, and we're really trying to prove that any child from any community can achieve, and we are seeing that. To be clear, first of all, African Leadership Academy is a two-year pre-university program. We enroll students from across the continent who are selected in a selective process, who have a lot of potential that they've demonstrated, uh, and they're coming to do a curriculum that's very academically rigorous. But we also, um, in the last <coughs> 10 when we were founded 10 years ago, decided we wanted to on, uh, incorporate entrepreneurship uh, into uh, what we teach, uh, largely because of this idea that not every single person is going to go on to university, and realistically, uh, a lot of the problems that need to be solved will require people thinking entrepreneurially, whether they can establish their own businesses or not. In that context, it is important for every single person in the classroom to have a meaningful preparation in education, to understand at least a little bit about <coughs> cognitive science, how learning happens and what your role is as a teacher in facilitating it. Technology is great, but if you um, aren't facilitating it using its sound pedagogical practices, it won't make a meaningful difference. In that context, I think we also need to think about different sorts of individuals that need to be in the classroom. Uh, I think if we are preparing people for more than just tertiary, <coughs> more than just the traditional knowledge production path, you need different sorts of teachers, some of whom will come from non-traditional backgrounds. Uh, Coded Minds has been around for three years, and we're already in six different countries. Uh, we keep expanding, and of course, Africa, for me, is, is, is a very important uh, place, uh, is a, a continent, and yes, you know, it's, again, it's about affordability, but at the same time, it's not just about affordability, it's actually about the social demographic of the education sector. You know, that, that in itself is a major, major problem, uh, you know, within the sector, whether it's teachers, as, as uh, you know, you rightly said, you know, who are very highly underappreciated around the world. Uh, and, and it should be quite the other way around, actually, if anything. Um, at the same time, the kind of stuff or the pedagogy that is taught in schools from a primary um, educational level needs to be completely revamped and re changed altogether, rejigged, if you will. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it's, no, it's great to be, you know, having good grades and becoming a great doctor, but if you're not having a good personality, you're going to be a pretty bad doctor, you know? <laughs> so, uh, things like that, I mean, all these things need to be taken into account. And, I mean, you touched upon entrepreneurship as well. I mean, these are all extremely 21st century skills that are required in the workforce <coughs> that schools and, and universities and colleges do, still do not prepare us for. Uh, you know, and that is a fact and we need to see that and that is the disruption that needs to happen. Stay tuned for more from the Future of Education Summit. Welcome back to CNBC Africa's special on the future of education, where themes related to education include public-private partnerships, learning for the 21st century, and how people can use technology to advance basic education. Work integrated learning was the topic for the next panel discussion. The education system has to produce creative problem solvers with critical reasoning skills to build an adaptable and resilient workforce. Work Integrated Learning. Dr. Kinsley Nyarako is the Acting Executive Secretary of the National Accreditation Board of Ghana and the Foundation Head for the Department of Teacher Education at the School of Education and Leadership of the University of Ghana. Dan Atkins is the CEO, Middle East for the Transnational Academic Group. He has lectured in IT, economics, accounting, marketing, management, organizational behavior, entrepreneurship, and law. Kirsty Chadwick is the group CEO of the Training Room Online, TTRO. She has a wealth of experience in designing learning solutions that use technology as a core enabler to transform educational and learning experiences. Cherise Drobis is the head of Career Management Services, Wits University. She leads all employability and employment initiatives for students and has supported more than 1,200 students on their learning journeys. Uh, starting with you, Kirsty, um, if you just give us a short, um, very short introduction on how you see work integrated uh, learning into the future. 
for, for us, um, I founded the Training Room Online in 2008. Um, we're a, a digital and blended learning solution design company. And we've been working extensively in both the public and private sector over the last 11 years here across the Middle East um, and into the UK. And I think what we really started to see, and it was referred to earlier, is this progression of lifelong learning. It's the need to be able to learn, unlearn, relearn at an accelerated pace because of what is happening within organisations as they transform and utilise technologies and what's available in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, so what we're seeing is the, 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 the trend and the transition from a micro-learning perspective in the workplace that people are needing to learn all the time. So it's a continuous learning cycle, um, being able to learn on demand, have access to good quality learning assets and things that they can reach into and find what they need when they need it at that moment in time and be prepared to accept that what they learn today may need to be unlearned tomorrow and something different relearned and applied. So I think it's a very, very different world that we're living in from a workplace environment and therefore our approach to how we design our learning um, solutions needs to adapt to that change. So uh, speaking from the perspective of a regulator, uh, we are always faced uh, with concerns about uh, society and industry regarding the, the lack of skills, skill sets uh, from graduates. And this uh, is very important and we think that we need to address it so that uh, the graduates we channel from our universities and other tertiary institutions will meet uh, the, the demands and needs of society, uh, more especially uh, industry, because that is how we can develop uh, our economies. So this is very qu uh, critical. And because of this uh, deficiency, uh, we have a lot of graduates uh, in, in our country who have not been able to get jobs. And this made the government to introduce a nationwide program called Nation Builders Corps, where about 100,000 graduates uh, have been placed within seven different models so that their skill sets will be enhanced for them to be ready for future job uh, opportunities. So we have, for example, Revenue Ghana, Educate Ghana, Heal Ghana, uh, I mean, Civic Ghana, Feed Ghana. And the idea is that by the time they are done uh, with this training program, which uh, is for about three years duration, they should be equipped so that the deficiencies that have been identified when they went to uh, the university would, would have been uh, gotten back for them to be able to be relevant to the job market. Sharice. I don't think we can underestimate the value of an appropriately designed, managed, mentored, uh, work integrated learning program. Um, I've, I've now um, managed 19 years worth of work integrated learning programs at the Graduate School of Business at WITS. And what I've seen through, through this time is young people who are carefully mentored, have appropriate, and it really, this is around, person-centered work readiness support, um, the right kind of partnerships with business, and um, the right design of academic learning outcomes results in young people who emerge at the end of this program confident with a strong sense of their own identity, with an ability to, to navigate the, the complex interpersonal dynamics of the workplace. And certainly as we're moving into a world of much greater digital complexity, an ability to start looking ahead or around the corner at what, what is um, next on the horizon. It's in a lot of companies' interest, taking young talent, people who want to learn the job, give them and also give them education at the same time. But how difficult can it be in this day and age to persuade companies to, to make that leap of faith? It tends to be very difficult because companies are looking at the bottom line for the next quarter. You know, if you ask them about their long-term goals, they'll talk about two quarters from now. And in that kind of mindset, getting them to invest in students who likely will be joining them in four or five years when most of the senior team will have moved on just doesn't seem to make sense to them. And I think the solution is going to have to be regulatory, where companies that don't get it are required to 
take on a certain number of students and achieve certain learning outcomes or possibly even do it as a, a tax incentive or tax credit where they can write off a certain amount of the costs that they invest in developing the next generation. Public and private sector partnerships. Chris Pogram is the CEO of Transnational Academic Group in Ghana. With over 27 years of experience in higher education sector, Chris has undertaken a comprehensive analysis of the higher education landscape in Africa. Professor Seth Coonan is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor International at Curtin University, Australia. Marius Oestesen is on the Faculty of Gibbs, specializing in leadership, strategy and ethics, and heads up the Future of Business project that uses strategic foresight methods to explore the future of South Africa. Some of the statistics that uh, have been given to me by our panelists here, I mean, Chris, we're talking about something like a billion children in the future on this continent who will need education. And meanwhile, the education system already is lacking behind. Give us an idea of how far behind. So what's, what's behind this? Um, as a region, Sub-Saharan Africa has the youngest population on the planet. And as well, it has the fastest growing population on the planet. So what you have is an ever increasing number of youth across the, uh, the continent. When you put on top of this, and there's been some discussion earlier around uh, a higher, edu well, education participation, I should say, straight from um, secondary all the way up to the higher education sector. Uh, although the participation rates are among the lowest uh, in the world right now, they're growing at the fastest rate. And so you have a very rapidly growing youth population. And ever more of that population is engaging in education. And so what's going to happen as a result of that? I think presently, and I, I come from the perspective of higher education, so uh, the principles cut across the entire uh, various sectors in education, but I think we're presently sitting at around 17 to 18 million uh, tertiary enrollments in Sub-Saharan Africa. You look at the numbers I just talked about, three decades out, that's going to equal between 70 and 80 million students who are enrolled in higher education. <clears throat> if you look at the capacity side for just a minute, uh, I think over the last two decades there's been a lot of investment across the continent into uh, primary education specifically, uh, and I think less uh, investment into higher education. And so we have situations right now, and I think it's well known, uh, there's discussions of a capacity crisis or, and whatnot, but uh, you have Universities, uh, for example, that have been designed for 10,000 students that are sitting with two, three, sometimes even four times that number of students. What's the impact of that on quality? What's the impact of that on uh, the ability for uh, faculty to engage in research? Uh, another result of that is we have more than a half a million students who leave the continent on an annual basis to study abroad. A number of these students, unfortunately, don't return. Uh, we also have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students who qualify for entry into academic institutions at the higher education level annually who simply can't get a, a, a spot. And so I, you know, I present this just so that we understand the scale of investment that's going to be required to provide the capacity for this, this growing um, population of, of individuals who will be wanting higher education. So I, I think the scope is really needed to be understood by everyone in uh, prefacing this conversation. Professor Coonan, I, mean, I think we all agree that the, the government coffers of the world can't provide the amount of education that's needed. Surely most governments with their salt will be saying to private money and investors, come, come to us, come put your money in here, we'll make it easier for you. Is that what's happening? Well, certainly many governments are doing that. So if you look at the government in the Emirates, in Dubai in particular, you know, they've had a particular strategy of speaking to international universities to try to bring them to Dubai so that Dubai can become an education hub and making it in the case of those that universities that work with the KHDA, the regulator in Dubai, they have to have what is called an infrastructure partner which is a private company that puts the capital in, puts the resource in to allow those universities to be sustainable and to have the right kinds of facilities and the right kinds of structures. So certainly there are many jurisdictions that have done that. 
Um, other jurisdictions use different models, but certainly if you look at China, if you look at Singapore, if you look at Malaysia in a different way, in each of these cases, the government sometimes creates tax opportunities, tax havens where, not tax havens, but free tax zones where companies and universities can come together to deliver education. So certainly, this is a, a recognized role of how capital and public universities can come together. And from the public university perspective, it is a very important aspect. Certainly for an Australian university, we are all public by and large with the exception of two or three. And we cannot use public money to open campuses in other areas. And therefore, we need to work with, um, with capital, with private providers to be able to look at how we can offer the kinds of education that we like in different jurisdictions. So we've certainly done that in now four different jurisdictions. And in each case, we have a different kind of relationship with capital, but in each case, it's essential that the risk is shared both from a legal perspective in Australia, but also from the perspective of how we can work and move ahead as a university. But we always get the impression as journalists that uh, business schools are relatively well healed compared to uh, other uh, tertiary organisations. Where do you see the future of uh, private and public participations and education in general in your sector? Well, I think that if we look out at the rest of the continent, South Africa included, and we say, what's the future of education? Really, that's a broader question. Uh, the tendency is to focus on education per se, but I think the bigger question is, what's the future of the economic development of the continent? What trajectory is that likely to take? And depending on what that looks like, what are the education requirements and possibilities contained within that? And if you look at Africa today, uh, we mentioned a billion people going to 2.5 billion people by 2050. 60% of those people today work and live in the informal sector, which means that they don't have infrastructure, they don't have businesses and corporations uh, through which they in engage in economic activity. Now that on the one side is a major developmental crisis of potentially another billion people being excluded from the formal economy, but it also represents an enormous business opportunity. So when we look at the continent, we see incredible opportunity in everything from resources to infrastructure to financial services. And of course, each of those opportunities represents an incredible, almost a mammoth opportunity for human capital development. And so that raises the question, you know, if we're going to give uh, a billion Africans access to electricity, uh, who's going to do that development? Is it government? It's probably not going to be government on its own. It's probably going to be through government private sector partnership. And if we are going to provide things like electricity, water infrastructure, sanitation, uh, just for those base industries, we are likely to need upwards of 50 million managers in the next 50 years. And so who's going to develop those managers? Well, institutions like Gibbs with partners from around the world. And we see that as an enormous uh, opportunity for partnership. The role of policy and regulation in improving education. Dr. Kinsley Nyarako is the Acting Executive Secretary of the National Accreditation Board of Ghana and the Foundation Head for the Department of Teacher Education at the School of Education and Leadership of the University of Ghana. Professor Narend Bajnath is the CEO of the Council of Higher Education. Before joining the CHE, he was Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of South Africa and Vice Principal Strategy, Planning and Partnerships at UNISA. Professor Kirk T. Semple is Professor of Environmental Microbiology at Lancaster Environmental Centre at Lancaster University in the UK. He is involved in developing and implementing the university's international strategy partnerships, particularly in Africa. Um, just give us a very short summation of where you see the future of, uh, of regulation and policy in the future. In the regulatory space, we are not very popular. I can't understand why. Um, I might have uh, pursued another career. Let's come to what the value and importance of regulation is. 
So if we take the example of uh, some of our sports, uh, cricket or soccer, which most of us enjoy, can you imagine if the game was played without rules, and if the, or if, you, if the referees or the umpires did not enforce the rules? Uh, that's the simplest way to put it. At one stage in South Africa, we had, uh, at the, uh, with the advent of democracy, we had over 300 private providers in the country. At the time, also 36 public providers. It was a free-for-all. Every university wanted to offer an MBA. Uh, we had uh, UNISA, where I worked for many years, had 7,000 programs on offer. And of course, it was a stupendous number and there were serious questions about the quality of many of the programs. So one of the first things we did after the merger that took place around 2004, uh, and also with a, with a very strong regulatory environment, regime that was put in place, was to bring, uh, bring every program under scrutiny and see whether it measured up to the new regulatory regime. So that helped us to weed out those programs that were worthy of being, uh, being uh, continued and those that needed to be uh, completely redeveloped, and those that just need to be tweaked a little and uh, offered. So what quality does, and quality assurance in particular, is protects the innocent and the, uh, the citizenry. That's a very important role that regulators play, is to ensure that you get what you are promised that you'll get, that when you get a qualification, it has value, and that it uh, earns you a job, that it equips you with the compendium of skills and capabilities that you'd expect from the level and the type uh, of the qualification. So I'm in the High Court uh, next week uh, because one of the privates has taken us to court because we de-accredited many of their programs. So this happens all of the time. So we, if a program does not withstand scrutiny and it does not meet the minimum requirements, we shut it down. It's as simple as that. To protect the uh, students and uh, also the society at large. Imagine, imagine if you're getting graduates who are trundled through a poor quality program uh, with poor facilities, poor teaching. In fact, we've had an example once of uh, someone teaching a program, uh, it was actually for corporate law, teaching corporate law, but with a qualification in journalism. You might say, well, not much difference, they're all bandits, but we don't agree. Uh, so you have to be careful. Uh, if, if you blur boundaries like that, those are the consequences. And you might think, well, the student has actually gone through a program, has had lectures and so on. So it shouldn't have done too much of harm, but of course it will do harm. So quality is very important. The whole idea of a regulation is to ensure that standards are met, talking about the minimum standards are met, uh, quality assurance is also in place uh, in the institutions of higher learning. And that makes uh, the role of the regulator very uh, uh, critical. Uh, the regulator, in most cases, uh, is seen in a certain negative uh, light. But our role is not to reach hand anybody, but to ensure that institutions do right things so that the quality of their programs will have uh, some form of positive impact on their products. When institutions are seen uh, to produce graduates of a certain high quality, then it brings satisfaction in society for citizens to want to go to those institutions. So our, our uh, role is very fundamental to the progress of institutions and their survival. So what we normally do is that we make sure that there is rigor in the entire process. Those employers might see some form of quality in the graduates we churn out. In most cases, I sit in my office and I receive so many letters from institutions, either educational institutions and also uh, organizations. And they want to find out the accreditation status 
of certain institutions, and at times, the programs. And in some cases, we've seen that uh, people have gone to certain institutions, but those institutions didn't have accreditation. And the effects on the student's future is so, so, so bad. Just imagine spending four years to obtain a, a degree, and you are told that your institution was not accredited and that your certificate is not acceptable. You wasted time, you wasted resources. Look at the pressure on parents. So that is why we are always meticulous, and we want to ensure that minimum standards are met. Students are also at the heart of the regulator. Their interest, for example, is very, very important. So, I mean, these are some of the things we do. Uh, at times, they think that the process is elaborate. But we need to do that. And I can tell you that because of our word dog roles, we have seen that institutions have improved upon their performance and also their facilities because they listen to the suggestions we uh, provide and they incorporate those suggestions and ideas into uh, their institutions, how to do things differently. And in so doing, they've gotten to a, 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 like a level where the students are satisfied and society is happy about them. From a UK perspective, um, this, is, this um, checks and balances has been going on for a very, very long time. Um, universities have traditionally been quite autonomous, but they've, they've had to follow a lead. So they've had to have um, programmes um, uh, assessed externally. Um, but more, more recently, uh, the, the government has introduced the, the uh, teaching excellence framework, which is um, a, an institutional assessment of um, quality of teaching. Um, and um, not, it's, it's, it's quite a young thing, but uh, <clears throat> Lancaster was lucky enough to win a, a gold award in TEF. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, what I'm, what I'm saying is that the, the university system is becoming more and more um, sort of appraised and assessed for its quality, not only in terms of its degree programs, but it's also it's the quality of the, an assessment of the teaching, the degrees that it's awarding, um, and that's because money is at the back of it. Students are having to pay more and more money for the, the privilege of education. So it has to be um, a good or an excellent product. Now, um, how does that relate to, to you know, um, Afri the African context? Well, um, I mean, my experience is that universities in, in, in the UK, in Europe, North America, and elsewhere, are becoming more global in the sense that they are looking to develop partnerships in places that they wouldn't have normally have done so in the past. Some of that's been driven by pure monetary opportunity. Some of it's actually been driven by research, as I've sort of talked about in my presentation. I'm sitting in the sort of place um, of a bit of both. Um, and, and, and what my experience is, is, has been that is that um, some of the some of the, the, the processes in this space are less mature, um, and, and in some cases perhaps absent. But by working with um, universities at an international level, um, it is possible to start to address that problem. Now I'm not saying, please believe me, I'm not saying that this is a plug and play. You take what Lancaster University does and you implant it in a university in, in, in Ghana or South Africa or wherever. It's a, it has to be fit for purpose. It has to be right for the university, for, for the accreditation board, for the, for the, for the policy of, of, of the country or the region. Okay, so we, uh, th that flexibility has to be there. It, it won't work, in my opinion, it won't work if you just take a UK or a European system of whatever it looks like and just smack it straight into, into a local context. It, w it won't work. Bringing the day's proceedings to a close was Roberta Nyka, Managing Director of the ABN Group. It gives me immense pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, I certainly enjoyed the conversation and I'm sure you have too. As Alex mentioned uh, earlier, we don't expect to have a solution 
to all of Africa's education problems in one day, but certainly we aim to contribute to some of those solutions by some of those con conversations today. I've been tasked to enlighten you on whom we are as a group and why we have embarked on this journey. Education to us is a great equalizer, no matter what our culture, religion, or social set we stand in. Education is the single most important defining factor which will enable our youth and our beautiful continent to step, aside, to step ahead with confidence into a brighter tomorrow. I would like to reiterate something that one of the pan panelists had, had said earlier. We can't have a great continent without a great education system. As a continent, we have certainly come far, but we still have a really long journey ahead. It's been an exciting day of robust discussion from leading policymakers and educators from all across the world. That's all from this CNBC Africa special on the future of education. <laughs>